All right, thank you. First and foremost, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it's very glad to see. I'm very glad to see so many of you here today. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. This is actually my second scariest talk. The scariest one I've ever had is one in Japan where I was live translated into Japanese, uh, with jokes being 15 seconds delayed. It's, it's horrible. Uh, so we'll see how this goes. Uh, yeah, so this talk is about user experience, or rather it's about all the stuff I've learned during the last three years of building a peer in from what was essentially a tech demo into what is like a successful product or semi-successful product at least. So I hope it's going to be relevant for you uh, and that you can learn something as well. So yeah, as mentioned, I am Daginge. I am a tech lead in Appearin, and I've been sort of around all over the code base, both back end and front end. Uh, and I'm also doing a lot of the product development and some of the marketing work as well. Uh, it's been very insightful. So I always have to ask, how many of you are familiar with Appearin from before? Show of hands. All right, so about 20%. So that means I can go through my introduction slides. Uh, basically, we are a video chat service based in browsers and on mobile devices. And we're built on something called WebRTC. Um, and we provide what is sort of a different user experience and a different approach to video chatting than what you may have seen before. Um, there are a lot of services that are similar to this. But basically, what you do is you go to appear.in slash Anything it can be your name or the name of your company or the name of your team. Uh, and you send that link to whoever you want to talk to. And once they click it, they will appear with high quality audio and video uh, with no need to register, no need to download anything. It just works. And this is sort of a showcase of the power of the web um, to just let this work. Uh, and we launched back in uh, 2013 as the first uh, sort of commercial product based on this. So we've been having some traction and learned a lot about uh, what it means to actually build products. But it all started with the interns, as many projects do. So we were at once like an R&D company inside a large telecom operator. We'd be doing a lot of communication apps. And every summer, we would have students from universities that we hired in, and we sat them to do projects that were sort of a little bit cool, and they could sort of play around and learn stuff, and we were their mentors. And we had this idea. We know that WebRTC was coming. Uh, we didn't know a lot about it, other than it was for peer-to-peer -peer video. Um, and we wanted to see what we can create with it. In addition, we've had a lot of problems with uh, getting our standoffs to work. I mean, we spent 10 minutes every day trying to just get the damn thing to work. Uh, that's very annoying. So we had this idea that what, what if it could work with you just sending a link to someone, and then it just magically worked. The link was sort of the room, so to speak. So we had three students, and we had six weeks, and we had this idea. Uh, and it was a very ambitious project. Um, Uh, but the, the instance are feel free to choose the technologies, how the, how the service looked, uh, and how they worked. Uh, and after two weeks, we had our first uh, demo. Uh, so the students sort of shaking and were very ashamed of the thing that I've created. They uh, uh, showed up there in front of like 50 people, most of them engineers, uh, and showed us something quite amazing, actually. We got our minds blown because they, they showed off not only having one-to-one -one video communication work, but they've made it work for groups. And this was so good that during the demo, people were typing in the URL that they were using and joining the, the chat as well. And this was, at least in 2013, this was, yeah, mind-blowing. Nobody had seen anything like this before. And it worked in Chrome Stable and later in Firefox and Opera and other demos as well, or other browsers as well. So needed to say, excitement was high. And it was this sort of early demo that sort of got us uh, into the idea of this can actually be turned into a product. So the last four remaining weeks, we gave them a designer, and we gave them some, uh, some more feedback on how you can actually develop this into a product that we launched. And that was the initial story of how Appearin actually came to. Uh, and you can recognize a lot from the, the service that you saw before and the service that they built after six weeks. The video layouts is mostly the same, but the colors are a bit different now, and uh, there are much more functionalities. Uh, and after the intern period was, was finished, we decided we should just launch. And this is sort of, 
In a telecom uh, industry, launches are measured in millions, uh, both in the amount of money you spend and how many users you reach. But we decided to do something a bit different. Uh, and we were lucky to do that because during summer in Norway, there's about this four or five week period of time where all the grown-ups are on holiday, uh, basically. So nobody's there to tell you, ah, you probably shouldn't do this. So you wrote a quick blog post, you posted it on Hacker News and Reddit, because that's how you sort of launched stuff back in the day, or probably now as well. Uh, and the feedback we got was just amazing. We got a lot of attention, the same reaction that we got in that first initial demo. And while our service struggled, and there were a lot of things we should have done better, and uh, we crashed a lot, uh, people in general sort of saw the idea, and we saw that this was something that we should really put more focus into. That gives me to the first lesson. I overheard a conversation earlier today about some guy, uh, I don't know his name, or I wasn't meant to listen to a conversation or anything, but uh, he wanted to launch his open source project. He was like, no, 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 I have to, it uses required JS, so I have to do it in something other, uh, other thing, and it's, uh, I have to redo the APIs and that kind of stuff. That doesn't matter, you should just launch early. If you aren't a little bit afraid or a little bit ashamed of what you're launching, uh, you're launching too late. Because the best feedback that you can get is that actually someone uses your product, uh, they love it, and you get motivation from that, and you get prioritization. What should you actually fix instead of just sitting there and sort of coding away and not really knowing the direction that you want to go in and then ending up never launching? And if we hadn't launched back then when this was so fresh, we might have never been where we are today because we got a lot of uh, attention from being the first mover. So yeah, we had a rocky first few months. We were uh, uh, a bit lucky to have another project shut down, so we had a lot of engineers to sort of pick and choose from from day one. So we set up a small team. Uh, we had like three redesigns. Uh, we tried to figure out who we were and what we wanted to be until we finally thought that we had it. We were going to be the world's biggest WebRTC video conferencing service. Yeah. But uh, that doesn't really work. And admittedly, we did get a lot of positive feedback because we were WebRTC-based, and that was kind of cool and hip at the time. Uh, and that gave us a lot of buzz and initial attention, a lot of blog posts that got us users. But in the end, the truth was that the average user couldn't care less. WebRTC simply wasn't important to them. Uh, and WebRTC wasn't why people loved us, at least not directly. Because when it all came down to it, all of these services work. I mean, Skype, FaceTime, Hangouts, and Messenger, they all work for the average user. And most of the conversations that you have are between people that you're already connected to. You're already taking the investment of downloading this application, uh, setting it up, and it just works for you. So WebRTC in itself was not something that would get us users. So you have to go back and sort of figure out what could we build that was better? and figure out what was the reason prefer people preferred us over those other much larger services. Because you could see that we were getting users, we were getting attention outside the fact that it was WebRTC-based. So we started looking at what people said. Uh, and we got customer support feedback, we got Twitter messages or comments on blog posts, and the same sort of tag that has now become our tagline is no logins, no installs, and free for update people and just share the link. Uh, it was super easy, and everyone could do it. So it was really the user experience of it all that made the difference. We had created something that was easier and better than the alternatives, and it had nothing to do with technology, at least not directly. And once we changed focus to that, a lot of other people also started talking about us, because we changed our marketing message, we changed the message that we were sending with the product. Uh, and then marketing sort of happened for us because people, when people love your product, they will actually share it to their friends. Uh, they will be the market engine that you need. So user experience is what made us better, but technology was the enabler. I think that's important to remember for a lot of other stuff as well. Because the user doesn't care about technology. And this is true for whether you're building a product or whether you're building a library. In the end, nobody really cares if you're using React or Angular behind the scenes. Uh, nobody cares what build system you have. Uh, spending time building the product and figuring out 
what the product is and how it works, it's that much more important than spending time, uh, for example, scaling to 200 million users without you actually having a product that will do that. Okay, so people loved us, but they weren't coming back. That was a sort of our second issue. Um, so we knew that sort of from the feedback that we got that we had something that worked, but uh, retention was sort of low. And this is pretty common for very many other applications as well. After all, other services work just fine. And we had this sort of recurring feedback that was, but we really think your product is the future. But that doesn't really help us. We need users and people now to get funding to keep going doing this. So we have to find ways to make our product more sticky. But how do you actually do that? How do you find these magical ways that would actually get people to come back? Well, we started out small. Uh, so this is a sign in Norwegian. I'll translate it for you. Uh, it's the actual sign we used around Oslo. Uh, it basically said, we will buy you coffee if you spend 15 minutes uh, testing out our new video chat. It's because we had this problem where users are global. We had a lot of users everywhere. And since we didn't have user registration, it was hard to get in touch with them. But when it comes down to it, most of your users are ahead of you. So by just going out there and actually start talking to people and trying to understand what their problems are, uh, how they use applications today, and sort of uh, what they think about your application or what, whatever you're building is very, very important. And doing something small like this, which isn't perfect, is much better than not doing anything at all. That's the next lesson we sort of learned, was uh, actually talk to your users. Uh, because only your users know what they need, uh, what they want, what their problems are, and how your product can fit in to solve those problems. Because creating a cool service is meaningless if it doesn't solve a user problem. Take, for example, Google Wave, which, when it was launched, is some of the coolest tech presentation that I've seen in my life. I mean, I don't know how many actually saw that, but it's, uh, they showed off live editing, uh, the diffing thing, and it was just whatever Google Docs has now. They, that was it. But Google Wave in itself did not solve any user problems. I still have problems describing what Google Wave was. I still can't sort of describe, was it a task manager? Was it a collaboration thing? I actually don't know. But I took the technology that I had there and put it into other products where they actually solved user needs, like in Google Docs. So I want to talk to you about two ways of getting feedback as well. So there's two ways of doing research. Either you have quantitative data or you have qualitative data. And very often, I see that a lot of people use quantitative data and only that. So you have metrics, and you have your funnels, and you try to measure all things in your application. Uh, and that's fine, because metrics can tell you what the user does. But it will never tell you why. So take an example. We can clearly see that we have a high acquisition, like many people come to our page. We have high activation. They use our product. And we can clearly see from metrics that they don't come back. But we don't know why. And that's where the qualitative research comes into it, actually talking to people. So after a while, we sort of grew out of the coffee shop method. And we started hitting more complex problems. Uh, and that's where you set up sort of a proper user testing session. And for us, it was very important that we include the entire team uh, so that you have different perspectives on how you solve problems. So we sat together uh, diverse teams of designers, a researcher, engineer, and marketing. And they together worked with talking to users, actually being there in the feedback, creating these prototypes together, and testing out the solution when you thought you had something that worked. Uh, that really helped us understand the complete picture of a problem, instead of just having the user researcher go out, get all the answers, and then come back with sort of, this is the way we have to solve it. Then you lose the perspective of, for example, the designer or the engineer. And we made prototypes to show people. Sometimes they were on paper, sometimes they were in code. We did whatever made sense at the time, or what took the least effort for us to do. So this is an example of the new room layout for mobile we tested out, where we wanted to test out 
if people understood the icons with or without text, if they understood uh, the interaction that we wanted to go, if they understood long press and that kind of stuff. So that was a, a combination of both paper prototypes and code implementation. Right, so when you do your user research, um, it needs to sort of be focused on a target. You can't really go out there and interview everyone. Uh, and I see a lot of other applications, and we did that ourselves in the beginning. We wanted to make a service for everyone. Like, that makes sense, right? We wanted to make a service big, we wanted to have lots of users, so naturally everyone and their dog has to use us. Uh, but it doesn't really work. Because people have different expectations. So let me show you a quick example of that. So what do you think is the difference between these two users? So the girl on the left, uh, she's 18 years old. She goes to high school in Norway, and she's one of our teen ambassadors. Uh, that is people that sort of talk about a product, and then we include them in, in the product development and teach them how to sort of do that kind of stuff. She mostly talks to her friends during class and after school about various things. Uh, and they have a different usage pattern than what you might expect. So they mute their audio uh, because they're in a privacy-sensitive setting. So they want, don't want a teacher or their parents to hear about what they talk with their friends. They use chat a lot more. And then on the right, you have Svein. He's my boss. He uses Superior a lot, naturally. Uh, but he has meetings, so audio is very important to him. And he usually has meetings one-to-one, -one, while the teen users has a group of friends talking together. So they don't expect the same thing from the service. But who do you prioritize? Who do you get the most growth from? Who do you want to create the product for? That's our next lesson that we had. We have to get a target market. Because in the beginning, we didn't. And then we ended up doing all these different things. We, had, we tried to solve problems that had different solutions for different people. So we ended up choosing teens. They had a new interaction we hadn't seen before, so we were confident that we could create something that they wanted to use, that none, no other services would, were doing at the time. And they had viral growth, because they shared them with their friends, who shared it with a larger group of friends, and they shared it with a larger group of friends. So we chose to implement stuff like stickers, bolder colors, a better chat, instead of meeting invites, um, um, booking meetings, email invites, or calendar updates. Uh, or stuff like call-in, cell phone numbers, or that kind of stuff. But it's important to remember that even though you choose a target, that does not mean that your product will only fit those people. For example, our business users loved our new stickers. <laughs> because when we designed this, we solved problems for teens, but we made sure that we don't alienate other people as well. Because the problems that we're solving are often fundamentally the same thing. But a target lets us easily prioritize. We can easily say that, no, we're building this feature for teens, and we're not building this because that doesn't have priority right now. Right. Then comes another problem. Because once we started doing all of this, and we started getting it right most of the time, we started innovating way too much. Quite honestly, because we were overconfident, because we had so much success, um, we thought that we could change everything at once. There were a lot of things that we hated with current apps, uh, or things that we thought we couldn't do, or things we wanted to change. So for example, we knew that we needed some kind of user model. But our entire tagline for the server is no login. So naturally, we couldn't have anything with login. Or how do you create a user model without login? So we figured out, uh, thought a lot about it, and figured out that, yes, access profile. That's a lot better login than anything else. And we made sure that the form was nowhere near recognizable as a login form either. Uh, and through user testing, this tested fine. I mean, we were just not asking the right questions, because we were showing this in isolation. Uh, and most users are inclined to say yes when asked, do you get this? Of course, they want to say yes if do you get this, or can you make this work, or can you click to do you understand what send code means. They do, but the expectation that they have when I want to create the user is not access profile or claim room. So, quick question here. Uh, where do you sign up? 
Yeah, I'm not going to get into the answer, but uh, up in the top right corner, the Claim Room button, that's basically where we want you to click, because all the other cool features that we built were hidden behind that little Claim Room button. There's, we had no way of telling you that was sort of the, the main action that we wanted you to do. Uh, and users didn't even see the, like, there was no sign up button that sort of gets people going, usually. So a lot of people did not end up seeing the new stiff stuff that we built, which means that all the retention mechanisms that we put in place were for 90% of users never seen. So that brings us to the next lesson, keep innovations to a minimum. I firmly believe that you have innovation points that you get to spend for each product that you have. And once you're done spending them, then you have to do stuff by the book, like, because users need to feel familiar. They need something to compare this new experience that you're giving them, this new uh, either way of doing things or that kind of stuff, with something that they have experienced before. Otherwise, they're going to feel confused or you're going to make them feel stupid because nobody wants to not get it. And especially if their friends are saying, oh man, this new service is so cool, and then they start using it and they don't get anything. And leaving your users feeling stupid will ultimately make them leave, which is not what you want. So eventually, we listened, and we made logging and sign up the way it was supposed to be. Uh, and we made it a better call to action. And we went from having two to three support cases every day of people asking us, where do you log in? Like, they've managed to claim a room, but then they've sort of switched computers or come to a new device. And I didn't figure out how to log in, naturally, because it never said log in anywhere in our system. We made sure of that. Yeah, <laughs> I hear someone laughing. But, uh, this was a serious thing we did. Uh, and after we changed it, we, had, we haven't had a single support case about it in eight months, and perhaps longer now even. Right. Which brings us to uh, another lesson. That is, listen for feedback. Because, uh, and I'm really glad sort of Miles had the empathy talk because a lot of the feedback stuff is about having empathy for your users, understanding and setting yourself into their place and understanding the problems that they have with what you're trying to create. Um, so we did a lot of different things to listen for feedback. The obvious choices are, of course, having uh, a support email or anything like that. Um, but we also had set up something we call the ambassador program, which were uh, teens that liked our product, we used to go out and have lectures in schools about coding or whatever, and then teens that were interested in sort of learning more or talking to us, we made them our ambassadors. So then we could use them to sort of ask, hey, this new thing that we're making, does this make sense to you at all? Or for the stickers, like what stickers should we create? So that kind of stuff. And it's also a good way to, to get and listen for feedback is actually finding out who your users are and then reaching out to them and asking, hey, do you actually like our product, or how can we make the stuff better for you? But even if you do everything right, or you think you do everything right, the code that you write may still break it all. And this is a, a horror story from, from a time that we, we had a successful feature. It did what it was, it was supposed to do, but something went horribly, horribly wrong. Uh, so it, we introduced uh, a concept we called following which is basically that you get notified when someone sends a chat message or joins a room or something like that. And the intention here was that the user wanted to figure out, or actually teens wanted to talk to their friends, and they wanted to know when their friends were on the service and what they were talking about. They had a fear of missing out. Uh, and the same was true for teams. They wanted to see if their team was currently in a stand-up or what have you. Uh, and we tested this well in beforehand. We felt that we, we really understood the problem. Um, and we, of course, wanted people to come back, so notifications is sort of a very obvious way of doing that. And the feature itself, that was a success. A lot of people actually started coming back, and they used the feature the way we, we envisioned it. And the metrics looked good. But then we started seeing something weird. The performance on our server was, was horrible. Requests were taking more than five seconds, and... Uh, this, at first, wasn't very surprising to us because, first, we had a sudden influx of many new users. The teens are starting spreading it to their friends, and we saw like, a doubling of user numbers. And at the time, we were running uh, a single server in Ireland with one Node.js process. Uh, we did that for two years, and it worked fine. Uh, 
but we figured like at some point scaling is going to be an issue. Uh, so we started working on improving that, of course. But at the same time, we saw that there were two rooms with very easily guessable room names that were extremely active. That every day of the, uh, of the hour, every hour of the day, uh, people were in there filling up the, with eight people. And we didn't think much about it, but one of the rooms were actually owned by one of the teams, so we went in there to check out what was going on. What we found was people just chatting together, getting to know each other. Nothing serious, but one, so one person left, another person joined. Uh, and this was sort of, sort of fine, we thought. We didn't think much more of it. But the performance of the server got worse and worse, and we started shutting off more and more features to try and actually get it up and running and have the core service at least work. And once we killed notifications, everything suddenly improved. So we sort of had like a hint of where the problem was. So we started investigating. So it turns out that the feature that we built had some, due to mostly technical debt and other yeah, reasons that come from having a product running for two years, uh, some weird code paths. Uh, and we had designed this feature to be mostly for six to seven people. Uh, and we hadn't given much thought to performance, uh, like at all. It didn't really matter if we did one or two extra database queries. We didn't look into that. But it turns out that for every follower, we were fetching uh, the user data from the database. Using this, this is actually almost correctly copied from our, from our code base. Uh, we would map over each follower. And then we would have something called the user enricher, which unless you were familiar with the code and the person implementing this was not, it actually made a database query. And this was fine for 10, maybe 15 people. But when you had 500 plus people following a room, for every chat message, you would do 500. And then, for some weird reason, we were throwing away the data that we got here and then doing the same query three or four more times, uh, which ended up resulting in we had 2,000 database reads and 1,000 database writes per chat message sent in those rooms that were active all the time, which is crazy. Um, yeah, so actually the database was backed up. Uh, that caused long event queues, a node, and triggered garbage collection. Everything went to... Uh, yeah, everything went to mock, really. So and actually we fixed it by having smarter queries, and we do what developers do, we sort of fix our problems. But it's a nice example of how the feature that you thought you, you knew exactly how it was going to be used was used in a totally different way than you expected it to. And the code that you write was actually negatively impacting the performance of the server because of it. Uh, and this happened because uh, when teens couldn't talk to their friends, when they weren't there, they were seeking other people to talk to. And when they found these rooms with a lot of users, naturally they wanted to follow those rooms so they could have people to talk to. And it wasn't generally like a, a good atmosphere in these rooms as well. So there wasn't anything like dangerous going on or, or awkward going on, really. Anyway, that was a bit of a digression. But I hope to have showed you that, sort of through my own experience, that user experience is about a lot more than just green and red buttons. It's about how you go about understanding problems, how you talk to users, how you find minimal solutions to implement something as fast as you can uh, to test it out. It's about how you implement them. It's about the presentation and the messages you send uh, to users in the end. And finally, how you refine that solution based on the feedback. And really, it is about how you write code, how you approach problems, and how you communicate with your team and your users. So I really think that user experience is everything. And that was it for my talk, more or less. Thank you.